Okay, we are recording. So let me hand the floor over to group one. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Trom. Uh, we first just wanted to say thank you everyone for coming. We're really excited to present to you our project we've been working on this semester. And our heliostat module is called Mirlar, the Mylar Mirror Heliostat. We are group one consisting of Tomas Bertone, Sheila Dunn, Zaywan Jin, Dana Kendall, Rayoma Molnar, Cameron Nan, and Brooke Olson. Uh, just to echo what Dr. Trom said, our presentation is exactly 30 minutes. Um, and we would like to urge our guests to hold their questions to the end, the other 15 minutes, um, in case your question gets answered in a later slide. Um, and we also have slide numbers, um, page numbers, if you will, throughout the presentation. So if you do have a question and you want to jot down what slide number it was on, we can flip back to it at the end for you. So with that, our agenda for today is to go through our three main subsystems. We have the mirror subsystem, which is versatile. We have our actuation subsystem, which is actually integrated into our design. We have our structure subsystem, which is dual purpose. And today we'll also be talking about some key features of our design, including Mylar, and we'll end off with a cost summary. So to start off our main design focus, we really sat down and thought about what we're deeply passionate about, what, what we can be best at in the world and what drives our economic engine. And this is commonly known as a hedgehog concept. So what we are deeply passionate about, we determined was unique resources. What we can be best at in the world is creative ideation and what drives our economic engine is a lower manufacturing cost. So ultimately this led our group to the choice of a main design focus of using Mylar in our Heliostat module. So what is Mylar? It's a polyester film. It has 95% reflectivity and a high manufacturability. And why would we wanna use Mylar? Well, ultimately it's very low cost, it's lightweight and portable, and it's also flexible. Um, and Mylar is seen in a wide range of industries, including dance studios, food packaging, and even greenhouses. So as was said earlier, the heart of our design lies in our mirrors. Uh, each mirror consists of a uh, metal mirror frame and a mirror block. Uh, each mirror block is composed of a rigid foam block and a metalized mylar film, which is wrapped around said foam and heat shrank. The mirror frame consists of a steel sheet metal box and steel axles welded onto the metal box. Uh, as you saw, the metal block is pressed into the metal box, which allows for easy swapping between a fresh and degraded mirrored mirror blocks. The mirrors are also attached to the box by nails, as you can see, uh, which can be pried off before removal. Uh, the mirrors are uh, also supported by a rigid structure. Uh, this structure consists of a pair of PVC pipe poles, uh, which will be zoomed in soon, and a mirror cradle, which is also made of PVC. Uh, the PVC poles are uh, driven to uh, holes dug into the ground and are secured with concrete. Uh, so these mirror cradles also provide a mounting point for the four mirrors and the um, and are composed of PVC pipes and corners. The PVC, the uh, pillars and cradle are attached using a steel axle as shown. A uh, power supplied using two motors. Uh, one servo controls the mirror's azimuth and drives the mirror axles. The mirror axles are uh, mechanically linked with timing belts and pulleys, which will be shown soon, allowing a single motor to drive all four ax uh, mirrors at once. The second motor um, is a high torque motor, is a high torque motor, which drives the uh, pole uh, cradle axle. As you can see. So um, these are uh, controlled by an ESP32 microcontroller housed in the pillars. Uh, this ESP32 is a uh, has built-in Wi-Fi capabilities, uh, making an economical option. Oh, and the um, the uh, microcontroller sits on a metal shelf, which is grounded onto a metal pole. So I'm going to dive into our mirror subsystem. Um, so our reflective surface, like we've mentioned, is a mylar film heat shrunk around a foam block. Um, typical mylar is not capable of withstanding ambient conditions for extended periods of time. So we are using an outdoor grade mylar equipped with UV resistant aluminum coating. Um, the film has a five year lifespan and when the mylar must be replaced, it costs 94 cents per block. So the foam block is a block made of rigid PVC foam with a smooth surface. So when the mylar is heat shrunk to it, there are no bumps or ridges. The block is moisture resistant. And when the block is replaced, um, it costs 17 cents per block. So the frame that holds um, the foam block is made of 16 gauge steel sheet metal. The sheet metal is bent into this 
square shape and has a circle hole in the bottom. Carbon steel axles are welded onto the frame um, on the sides and those are then attached to the structure. There are two lift resistant nails um, that press into the foam block and hold them in place in the frame. Some key features for our mirror subsystem is that there are four total heliostats per module and each heliostat is 0.25 meters by one meter for a total area of one meter squared for the module. And the mirror blocks are also replaceable. So in order to replace these mirror blocks, um, the heliostat can be flipped over um, or each of the heliostats so that the mylar is facing the ground. Um, the nails must be removed first and then a dowel can be used to push the blocks out of the frame. Then new blocks are pressed in and the nails um, are secured back in place. So based off of the customer needs um, that were given to us by the customer, we associated these customer needs to our mirror subsystem. And so to satisfy these, um, I'm just gonna go through some of the data that is specific to our module. Um, so the collection area of our heliostat is one meter squared. To ensure ambient conditions did not affect the module, um, we wanted to make sure the coefficient of thermal expansion was not too large. Our coefficient of thermal expansion, um, which is for the mylar, is 1.7 times 10 to the negative fifth. The mirrors can be cleaned every three days with compressed air and every two weeks with water and cleaning solution to ensure that there is no buildup of dust and dirt. To reach a thermal input power of one megawatt, we focus on increasing the reflective surface area um, of our heliostat. So each mirror has a surface area of 2 point, or 0.25 meters squared. In order to have a solar concentration ratio of 1,000 suns, the geometric ratio, concentration ratio should be as large as possible. Um, and so our ratio is one for our module. And like I said before, we have four heliostats per module. And to ensure that there is no shading, we focus on keeping the module off of the ground. Um, therefore, each mirror is 0.48 meters from the ground. And the ratio between module area and reflecting area should be small. So our ratio is 1.48. And to account for light dispersion, the reflectivity should be high and the ref reflectivity of mylar is 95%. The customer prescribed the need of having a heliostat field that generates a thermal input power of one megawatt. To determine the total in thermal input power, the input power for each individual module was calculated using uh, an equation prescribed by the customer. And the thermal input power per module was determined to be 500 watts. So 2000 modules are required for the field. The customer also asked that we meet a need of a solar concentration ratio of um, 1,000 suns. And so we also were able to calculate out, back calculate out how many of our mirlar modules we would need in the field to achieve this 1,000 suns. Uh, we also use an equation prescribed by the customer and we were able to calculate out that we would need, again, about 2,000 um, modules in the field to achieve this need. The actuation system consists of two motors and a series of belt and pulleys. The servo motor is responsible for controlling the azimuth angle of the mirrors by driving a belt which rotates the mirror shafts. The servo provides a torque of about 7.4 pound inches with an operation voltage between 4.8 to 7.2 volts and an operating speed of 0.17 seconds per 60 degrees. The mirrors are linked through four GT2 timing belts and eight timing pulleys allowing for synchronous movement. Due to the slow rotational speeds and GT2 belts having a service life of 100,000 miles, the belts will be more than able to survive the 20-year lifetime criteria. The two ends of the belts will be bonded together using rubber cement glue, and each belt will be tended to two-pound force. The NEMA 17 stepper motor will control the altitude angle by rotating the entire frame. The stepper motor has a torque of 3.9 pound inches, an operation voltage of 5.3 volts, and a step angle of 1.8 degrees. In addition, a driver was added for communication between the controller and the stepper motor. Other key features of our actuation system is it all fits within the PVC structure, which helps to withstand ambient temperature and weather conditions. Lastly, both motors can be wired directly to the controller. 
As seen on this slide, these are the customer needs we associate with the actuation subsystem. To keep the cost below $100, we require the actuation system be below $60. And this design only costed $26.90. To redirect sunlight up to the tower, we wanted the design to have a range greater than 90 degrees, which the design exceeds in both the azimuth and altitude angles. To keep optical accuracies below the 40%, we, want to, we wanted motors with accuracies less than 0.9 degrees, which both a servo and stepper achieve. For tracking the sun throughout the day, we required more than one axis of rotation, which isn't an issue since this design has two. And for tracking via controller, we wanted to limit the design to, below, to be below four unique signals, which this design accomplishes by only having two unique signals. A torque analysis was completed on the module to determine the torque required to rotate about the azimuth and altitude angles. The calculation was made by computing the frictional force by multiplying the normal mass by the coefficient of friction for the bearings. To account for the factor of safety, the frictional force was multiplied by two. The torque was then calculated by multiplying the frictional force by the distance it is away from the point of rotation. This equation yields that the torque required to control the azimuth angle is approximately 0 0.08745 pound inches. And to control the elevation angle is 2.3 pound inches. Each motor can provide a torque more than the minimum torque that is required to actuate the system. To determine the altitude range, we need to first know which angles we are looking for. As shown in the illustration, the red arrow lines represent the sunlight. Because the angle of incidence equals to the angle of reflex, the maximum angle below the horizontal line, uh, which is the blue lo horizontal line in the picture, is phi. And phi's are the same on both sides. Apparently, CLSS can be able to reflect the sunlight to any angle ab above the blue line. So the altitude range will be 180 degrees plus two phi's. It turns out to be 293.2 degrees. The Hilux Go ESP32 microcontroller was a recommendation from Dr. Chesney that actuates both motors. It has a CPU speed of 2.4 gigahertz. It has both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities. It actually comes with an antenna that can filter unwanted signals. So generating the correct signal output to both motors shouldn't be an issue. And it has a five voltage output, which the, along with the, since the motors both have drivers, the controller can correctly generate the correct out inputs to both motors. The most stressed component for the mirror sound assembly would be the mirror axles, since each axle has the weight of a cradle and the tension and the belts acting on it. So singularity functions were used to determine the deflection of the pulleys, because if the pulleys were to deflect significantly, it would hamper with the, op the normal operation of the module. And the deflection of the shaft for the, which is shown in the free body diagram and image uh, as seen in the slide, comes out to be 0 0.0068 inches. And this was determined to be insignificant for all mirror axles. Our structure is made out of PVC, a plastic that is highly durable in ambient conditions. It is comprised of two primary components, the cradle and the pillars. The cradle is comp comprised of a interlocked two inch uh, schedule 40 PVC pipes, which act as members. PVC elbows are uh, used to mount axles, which are attached uh, by PVC cement glue. The pillars are a uh, four inch schedule 40 PVC driven into the ground and are secured by cementing. The hollow PVC members allow us to house critical subsystems such as the actuation within the structure itself. Uh, this provides uh, the subsystem protection from the elements. Our structure can resist the following appropriate design challenges, including a 20 year lifespan, a mechanical factor of safety of two, and to ensure that the base is less than the reflecting area. So we found that the, uh, the structure can resist winds up to 91 miles per hour with the appropriate factor of safety, uh, that the lifetime of our structure is 100 years, and that the base mirror area ratio is 1.48, ensuring material efficiency. So to start off the calculations for the structure subsystem, we went ahead and performed a 
deflection calculation on the long edge of the PVC cradle. So with the weight of these mirrors, all four mirrors end up to a final weight of 46.64 pounds. And we just went ahead and made a conservative assumption that if all this weight was concentrated in the middle of this beam, would it deflect to a concerning amount? And the result of this calculation was that the deflection would be 0.237 millimeters. So the group determined that this deflection was not of concern to make this structure any more rigid or provide any extra supports on this edge. The weakest section of our structure subsystems will be the four inch shafts that connect the cradle and the ground poles as shown in the screenshot on the left. We simplify the model into a cantilever beam. The equivalent force on the shaft has two components, the wind, wind, uh, wind force and the cradle weight. The wind pressure is, can be determined by the first equation listed above and based on that, we can determine for the wind, wind forces. The cradle weight is fixed. Uh, it is 261 newtons. So the equivalent force will be acting on the FEQ position shown on the illustration on the right, which is 0 0.0365 meters away from the end. The magnitude of the force is square root of both forces. And the bending stress is MC over I, which I is the moment of inertia. From that, we can get the a number and it's the factor of safety that equals to the ultimate stress divided by the bending stress we got. Based on that, we are able to develop a code to find out what is our maximum wind velocity when it's equal to two. As the result uh, is 91 miles per hour, more than the maximum wind speed in Las Vegas in history. The lifting force needs to be calculated to know whether the mirrors will be pulled out of the mirror frame by wind. The lifting force can be calculated by the uh, following equations, where CL is the lifting coefficient. To find the CL, the following equations can be used, uh, where the alpha is the angle of attack, KP is the coefficient that has the negative correlation with the angle of attack. We need the, since we need the maximum lifting force, so uh, we need to maximum our Kp minimum alpha. As the table shown on the right, the maximum Kp will be 2.59 when alpha is 13 degrees. Air density is uh, 1.14 kilograms per meter cube under average temperature in Las Vegas, and the velocity in Las Vegas, four meters per second. To plug in all those numbers, we can get the lifting force around 6.47 newtons. Since stainless steel nails are stronger than the, our PVC form. We only need to calculate whether the PVC is strong enough to hold the normal stress or not. Normal stress acting on the PVC form can be determined by the force divided by the connection area of two nails. Normal stress on each connection is um, 0.126 megapascals, which is way less than the ultimate stress of the PVC form. In the event that the structure would be breached with water by being improperly sealed or blunt force trauma, a uh, heat transfer calculation was used to see the evaporation rate of water if, if there were standing water in the frame. And after using Newton's convection law, it was found that the evaporation rate uh, was 0.7 days per cup, which means that the module could resume normal op operation after a day. Here you can see how one of our modules is set up in the field in relation to the tower and the sun. So the tower location um, is right there, but the tower is 100 meters tall and on the tower, the receiver is one meter squared. Most people would think that the module's orientation rotates as it changes position in the field. However, all of our modules are oriented the exact same way. Um, the two vertical pillars of the structure, as you can see in this photo, are located along the north and south axis. This minimizes shading effects, and the sun will track over the module from east to west. So our entire sub our system is sealed from the environment, and this includes the ball bearings connecting the frame to the structure, and those are sealed ball bearings. Epoxy is used to seal the holes where wires come out of the structure 
and PVC cement glue is used to enclose the structure between PVC elements. Also, there are PVC caps over the pillars and the structure to enclose the motors. Some key features about our module is that the module area to reflecting area is 1.48, and the entire assembly has easy access to attach and remove pieces in case of damage. So uh, the customer needs that affected all subsystems within our module um, was that the OTS or the custom part price must be equal to or less than the OTS part. Um, and we found that all of our custom parts were less than the OTS price. And to satisfy innovation, um, we did a, um, a customer need um, questionnaire and and we received a score of four for cost, three for durability, and three for uniqueness from our instructor. So for this questionnaire, um, we talked to our instructor to receive these scores. Um, before doing this, we talked to the customer about which aspects of the design were most important to them. And these aspects were within the customer needs, but also outside of the customer needs. And the customer decided that cost durability and uniqueness were the most important to them. Therefore, we focused on these categories throughout the whole design process. Um, so we were rated on a scale of zero to five with zero being poor and five being outstanding. outstanding. <laughs> and we wanted to score at least a three in each of these categories. So if a specific design did not meet um, a score of three in a category, that design did not move on within our design process. So we talked to our professor, Dr. Mimi, and he rated our design in these three categories. And we received scores of three, three, and four for the entire module. So based off um, the cost of parts for our um, custom parts, we have found that they were all less than the OTS parts. And these are our specific custom parts for our design. Um, they are OTS parts that are machined. So that makes them custom. So this sheet metal box is cut on a water jet machine and the sides are bent up. Um, all three brackets are customized through water jetting as well. And then the controller bracket is bent as you can see. The two motor axles have holes within them to connect to their specific motor shafts for a tight fit. The axles are created on a lathe and mill. So from the beginning, maintenance has been a main concern. High maintenance increases the need for extra materials and workers, so we wanted to reduce that as much as possible. The structure is fully sealed from the environment by using sealed bearings at the rotational joints and using epoxy to seal any openings. All material that can make contact with the environment is waterproof, so it is not vital, vital to clean the joints or the structure because the bearings at the rotational joints are still operation as, operational as dirt collects. Mylar has a similar cleaning process to glass from a heliostat, heliostat dust buildup and a cleaning study completed by Sandia Laboratories. It is required to clean a mirror with a simple glass solution and a soft rag every two weeks to cover to recover 95% of the reflective loss. Additionally, because Mylar is a non-static material, it can be sprayed with pressurized air every three days to recover 95% of the reflective loss. Water can also be used to clean Mylar, but it reduces the reflectivity because it leaves behind residents Visitor streak, sorry. From our interview with a mylar expert, we learned that if stretching occurs in the mylar from debris, a simple heat gun could be used in that specific area to return it to its original form. So this is our cost summary table. The wholesale cost to build one module is $100.34. The prototype cost is $153.64. The parts for these prototypes cost roughly double the wholesale cost because the prototype cost is based off of retail prices from stores like Lowe's, Amazon, and McMaster. The parts for the wholesale cost were purchased from specialized manufacturing companies that offered a significant discount for ordering large quantities. The wholesale costs were based off the assumption of buying enough supplies to build 2,000 modules. The manufacturing labor was found using the unit cost for performing manufacturing processes. The um, assembly labor was based off the Bruthworth and Bruthworth scorch <laughs> and were assumed to be made um, on an assembly line. The worker salaries were based off the average hourly pay for a non-skilled manufacturing worker with additional pay for benefits and overhead costs. Energy consumption costs were estimated by 
the energy consumption for each large machinery used in manufacturing process. Additionally, the cost energy per hour was based off of a mid-sized manufacturing plant in Nevada. So this is our cost saving summary, um, how we <laughs> plan to cut our costs for each module. Raw material prices have gone up since the pandemic and have yet to drop. PVC prices have risen significantly three times since the pandemic and is currently double the price of what it used to be. This is due to multiple factors. One of the main reasons is that there are multiple US PVC factories that have shut down and have since to reopen. Steel prices have risen 126% and foam prices have risen 35% since 2019. Because of this, we estimated our listed material prices to be pre-pandemic prices and have found research that project the prices to return to normal in 2022. In respect to buying in bulk and shipping, we avoided purchasing from retail stores and ordered directly from wholesale manufacturers. Additionally, the international cargo shipping is at an all-time high. Prices have risen 345% in the past year. There's a shortage in global shipping containers. And I think we can all remember the Suez Canal accident that <laughs> impacted the shipping majorly. It was estimated that $3.6 billion were lost due to delays. So high shipping prices presented a challenge when finding our supplies. So we opted to find companies that offered free shipping when buying in bulk. We would love to go over the entire assembly process for you, but for the sake of time, we'll explain the most complicated part, which is the frames inner components. Since the motors and controls are separated to account for the EMF interference, the goal is to wire the motors to the high let go by running two south wires along the inside of the frame while completing the rest of the assembly. To do this, the first south wire that is attached to the separate motor is run down the side of the frame within the two inch PVC pipe. Next, the servo motor assembly is completed and the second south wire is connected to the servo motor. Both south wires are pulled through the T joint opening and hang freely. The third step is assembly the support and actuation system of the mirrors. To do this, insert the bearing into the T-joint and then slide the quarter inch steel shaft into the bearing. Next, insert the pulley on the shaft and secure it with a set screw. Secure a belt on the, on the first pulley and then attach the PVC piping between the two T-joints with PVC cement. Be sure to pull the two south wires through the piping while doing so. While waiting for the PVC cement to dry, use a hook to stretch the belt around the second pulley. This completes the assembly process for the mirror support and actuation system. This process will be repeated three more times to complete the frame. The two pulley systems on the other side will not have south wires running through the framing, so it will be shorter. So assembly time process on that side. Once the elbow joint is reached, run the two south wires up the side of the frame to the high let go, exit, and entrance holes. Be sure to leave slack in the wire while running it into the four inch PVC pipe to account for tension caused by rotating the frame. Once the wires are inside the four inch PVC pipe, solder them to the high let go and test the actuation system. If everything is working correctly, then you can secure all the PVC pipes and caps and fill in any openings with epoxy to ensure the module is sealed from the environment. So with this, why should our Mirlar modules be chosen for prototyping in email 4502? Well, we really broke it down to three main things. Our module is cheap. As you could see, we are right on the mark with that $100 cost. Um, our design is also simple. We use PVC piping for the structure. We only have two motors for the entire actuation. And our mirror blocks are easily replaceable. Um, we also took into consideration DFMA throughout this um, semester, design for manufacture and assembly, by doing things such as ensuring that all screws are easily accessible during assembly by a technician. We also made use of hex head screws instead of Phillips head screws so that Allen keys can be used for easier accessibility as well. Um, also, as you probably have noticed, not many of our parts are machined. Um, and if they are, none of our parts require finished surfaces. So this has helped us save on labor costs as well. Some additional details we'd like to quickly point out is that throughout this semester, our group really took the initiative to reach out to external parties, if you will, to kind of take our design to the next level. The first of which being that early on in the semester, we reached out to all three of our customers, um, Dr. Trainum, Dr. Sheffy, and Dr. Greenslit, to really learn the importance and how they kind of um, rank the differing needs um, of importance to them so that we could be sure that we are focusing on those specifically throughout the semester, along with all of the other needs as well. 
Um, we also reach out to one of our um, teammates, former bosses, Jenna Dolinar, who has used Mylar in industry to gain some key insight from her from a firsthand experience of using Mylar in industry. Um, and then lastly, we also reached out to Dr. Nini after having two different design reviews with Dr. Trom, we wanted to get some extra uh, feedback on our design. So we reached out to him as well, which was very crucial in taking our design. All of these are very crucial in taking our design to the next level. And with that, we just wanna say thank you, um, especially to our sponsors, Cummins, North of Grumman, Carrier, and Arrigo, and our two professors, Dr. Trom and Dr. Nimi, as well as all of the teaching assistants who've helped us with our project throughout the semester. Um, and with that, if you guys have any questions, I'm sure you do, um, feel free to unmute yourself or type them in the chat and we'd be happy to answer. Okay, um, good good brief. Um, Dan Ploiecki here from Northrop. Um, could you go to the slide where you showed the um, pulley arrangement and the serpentine belt? Um, yeah, right there. So, um, I think over time there's, and, and depending on how much heat you're exposed to, you might get some slack that develops in that um, belt. And it, it might be a good idea to have some type of a idler um, pulley arrangement. And that, that might be achieved by simply putting a through bolt through the, um, through the PVC that, uh, that kind of has a spring loaded idler on it that would always maintain uh, tension on that, uh, on that belt so that over time uh, you don't end up with a situation where you're jumping teeth or uh, uh, losing indexing. So that might be one thing you, you should uh, take into consideration. Um, other than that, uh, I had a question on um, your mylar is mounted on what type of a substrate? What, what are the panels actually fabricated out of? So they're made out of um, a PVC foam. Yeah, okay. so it's a rigid PVC foam. Okay, so and what is the thickness of that foam, that PVC foam board? Um, it's about one inch. About one inch, okay. And then that's mounted on a, uh, a steel box frame? Yeah, so it's pressed into the frame. Okay. And your mylar, how, how is that mounted to your PVC? So it's heat shrunk um, with a heat gun. So why is it that I would not expect any type of delamination or voids and bubbles being created with the mylar finish simply so, being heat shrunk? Um, so the heat shrinking is like the typical way that mylar is attached to surfaces in industry. Um, and the PVC foam is smooth, so it should not have um, intense bridges or bumps. But with the, with the sharp corners that you have, uh, doesn't that create a stress point where over time being exposed to um, uh, thermal expansion and so forth, you would, you would end up piercing the mylar at the uh, 90 degree uh, edges and create gaps. Maybe, I guess what I'm getting at is maybe you should round those corners. Yeah, that's definitely um, something, oh, sorry. Um, that mm -hmm. is definitely something we were um, considering throughout the design process, but ultimately um, after talking with our quote unquote mylar expert um, and also um, the conditions in Las Vegas being very hot, almost as if like a heat gun is constantly acting on the mylar film. Um, and also with the fact that we are already planning the anticipation of our mylar blocks to be replaced every five years. Um, with these just different aspects, we decided to keep the corner rectangular. We didn't have um, many concerns about, about rounding it out. But I mean, that is something when we get to, hopefully if we get to prototyping, um, if we realize it's a larger issue than all these things that we've thought of, we can definitely, that would be an easy design change. So, so I had two more questions. Um, the other question is there, there doesn't appear to be any mechanical stops that would limit travel uh, or movement of the, um, of the panels. Um, so what is it that you are using to prevent a, um, 
a excessive travel of the panels. There, it, well, there actually is a, mechan uh, a hard mechanical stop, and that's actually the nails that get driven in. So the uh, so the box itself has a um, has a couple of holes that you could um, you know, that can actually accommodate these nails and be hammered into these into the into the foam. Unfortunately, it, it, this does have the unfortunate side effect of a uh, complicating the uninstallation process of the foam block, but it does provide you know, pro positive mechanical engagement. So that that is how we addressed it. Okay, that's fair. So when um, when you find the position that you want this panel to be at, what parks it? Uh, is there a break within the motor assembly or is there some other break that actually keeps the panel in a stationary position? Are you folks muted or something? I'm afraid we don't under we don't quite understand what you've said. Could you please uh, clarify on that, clarify so, that? So so the panel moves right, and and it moves based on command uh, input from the from the drive motor. So the drive motor is going to move the panel, right? So so when you when you no longer want to move the panel, that you're happy with the position that the panel is in. How do you prevent additional movement of the panel? In other words, you got to somehow lock it in place. You have to hold it in position. So how would you hold the panel in position once the motor no longer has power being applied to it? Otherwise, it'll freewheel, right? The, the, the panel based on external forces, wind or or whatever it it will the panel once you remove uh, voltage from the motor it's going to be at the mercy of whatever external forces are applied to that panel so you somehow want to keep it in a stationary position is that the servo motor right so uh, my yeah. question is that does your servo motor have a brake on it or you it, are it, you going to continuously throttle that motor to hold position yeah, is that like a standard DC servo motor for like uh, from RC drones and things like that? Yeah, it is. Also, okay. just because it's slowly rotating throughout the whole day, so it's always constantly moving very minorly. So I think the motor will always be on and engaged. Right. Yeah. And uh, oh, and uh, in the uh, we can also we can potentially control the position uh, by adding a numerical integrator into the a numerical integrator um, to integrate the angular position of the motor as well to make sure it um, stays where it is, so. that That's actually already built into the servo motor. So I, I think his point is um, more about loading perhaps from wind. And it's it can be an issue with stepper drivers as well is, um, and I, I haven't noticed any group that's had a, a breaking thing, but it does take energy to keep it in its position, not just to move it. Um, and you know that's that's just part of the energy your design is going to be consuming. So if it's a breezy day, um, it's going to take, you know, consume a lot of excess power to keep it still. If it's still, no problem. Okay, if that's your design solution, then then, then that's fine. You just got to take that into your, your power consumption uh, calculus. Um, so one other question is, you know, there's going to be more than one of these. So somehow you have to harmonize positioning between all of the different uh, uh, assemblies that you have in your array. So um, normally what's done is you would have some type of a indexing mechanism, whether you have a, you, you would move the, um, uh, you would manually move the position of the, um, of your mylar reflectors in some known position and you would pin it there. Uh, and then you would then calibrate it in terms of your feedback and says, okay, this is the neutral position of the, um, uh, of the uh, mylar panel. 
and you would have to calibrate all the other ones so that your computer that's controlling all this would then know the zero reference position for all the panels. And then, it, then they could move accordingly. So it might be a good idea. And maybe you thought of this, uh, maybe you didn't, but it might be a good idea if you had some means of indexing your panel so you determine a zero reference point so that all the panels uh, in the array uh, have knowledge of what that zero reference point is and they all could move in, in, in harmony. Yeah, I think that's definitely a really good suggestion. Um, yeah, we throughout this whole semester, we are definitely bordering the line between the design of a heliostat and the design of the entire field um, and kind of where to where to exactly take that to. But that's definitely a design consideration we would want to um, look at for the design of the field and how they're working together, uh, the different modules. Yeah, other than that, I like the idea of using off the shelf, but very readable, readily available uh, materials. Um, I'm a little bit concerned uh, with two inch PVC over time being exposed to um, heat load, but okay. it may it may distort. You might get some some sagging or distortion, um, and I'm just uh, you know curious if you guys consider that. Yeah. So outside of the um deflection calculation from the weight of the mirrors. Uh, we didn't do any calculation for the weight of the mirrors over the 20 year lifetime. Um, but given the, the very small deflection from just the weight of the mirrors alone, we, um, I guess it didn't, it didn't cross our minds as a, as a huge concern. Right, right, right. That, that's, that's why having a, a self calibration Right. capability using that indexing feature is would be good because you know routinely you could have the mirrors recalibrate and so that if there is any any delta uh, difference between angle um, that would automatically be compensated for um, via the indexing feature uh, other than that other than that I, I like the idea you know uh, I think um, this is um, very cost effective and very functional. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Hi, uh, Brad LaCroix here uh, at, from Northrop Grumman. Uh, yeah, I, I like this design. Um, the, the use of mylar is, is interesting. And uh, yeah, it look, looks like you, you did a really good job on, on cost. Um, so I, I had a kind of a multi-part question having to do with the Mylar. Um, do you know roughly what the cost savings is versus um, some of the cheaper glass mirror panels? Um, I, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, I do continue. No, no go, go ahead, that, that's, that's the first part of the question, so. Yeah, yeah, so, so the real, um, so the standard, um, so, so the real standard for heliostats, right, is a uh, is actually um a, a, is from a design from uh, Sandia National Laboratories called uh, the ATS. Uh, I don't actually, sadly, I don't know what it stands for, and uh, which has a cost of about one hundred and twenty me uh, dollars per meter squared. The mirrors uh, themselves cost about a um twenty yeah twenty percent of that, around like twenty five meters yeah twenty five dollars per meter squared. So um so. And um, so even this, so yeah, so um, as you can see, um, this, um, the, our, our mirror self-assembly costs about a dollar and uh, 10, yeah, a dollar and 10 cents about. Now, even with the, uh, the fact that, you know, these mirrors, these Mylar mirrors are about a, um, you know, they have to be replaced every five years, you're still getting a, um, you know, a, a total cost about $4 and 40 cents per, um, you know, for the mirror over, over the uh, operational lifetime of the 20 years. So I'd say the um, the cost savings are about six, like yeah, about like sixteen dollars per meter squared, um, and you know considering the por proportions involved, you know it is pretty significant. So, okay, that, that's including the, the cost to replace. Then about you're yes. still you're still having a savings there. Okay. Yeah, we also considered um, so if like one of our heliostats gets damaged, the cost of replacing one of our mylar. Um, heliostats is way more like way cheaper than replacing a mirror. So we right. wanted to think about like 
damage. Yeah, one, yeah. one other potential benefit is uh, you do get a occasional hail uh, yeah. in the, even in Las Vegas area. So and, uh, um, I think the mylar would probably take impact a little bit better than, than glass. Um, another thing we thought about with the mylar too is just how light each one of these are. So requiring like less torque on our motor to turn a lighter heliostat also helped us buy a cheaper motor with less torque power. Right, right. Uh, I, I see the nail pictured here to, how many of those do you have to, to hold in the, the foam sheet? Is it just is one it, or is it? There's one, one, on, there's one on each side. side. Yeah. So, so two total? Yeah, so eight for the whole module. Okay. Um, the, the foam I'm thinking of is, is pretty soft and, and kind of crumbles when you when you push on it. Is that is that this kind of foam or is this something that's a little more? Yeah, so it's a, like uh, a lot more durable. Um, okay. It's like a rigid structure. Um, okay. And is I would think like more along like the plastic side, not like completely plastic, but not like squishy, crunchy foam. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's um like a PVC foam board. So if you think of like the Dollar Tree foam boards that you can think, but just think of an inch thickness, not just uh, thin. Okay. Okay, it's not the individual, not styrofoam basically. No. <laughs> but still lightweight. Okay, and then uh, was there a thought about how to install this into the the ground or or to? Yeah, so we have the four inch pillars um, secured with concrete in the ground. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, so each module will be as will be assembled in the manufacturing company and then we'll just um, ship them out to the site and then we'll just dig holes, stick them in the holes and then pour cement and wait for it to dry. Did you say there is concrete or it was just. Okay. It's concrete yeah. Okay. Uh, was there a reason for concrete versus just going with a longer pole and, and digging a deeper hole. Um. I think that was just based on cost. Concrete is extremely cheap and the four inch PVC pipe, it's just the pricing over the past couple of years have skyrocketed. And so the PVC or um, four inch pipes is just extremely expensive relative. All right. I, so I, I see there's a way to replace the, the mylar foam portions, but uh, if you wanted to replace like the entire upper unit, is there a way to, to remove that from, from the poles? Is that? bonded to the uh support as in like the entire um structure besides the poles is that what you're referencing yeah yeah basically if, if you had some issue with the servos or, or motor and you just wanted to swap out the entire top piece um is, is that That's easily true. taken so, off and, and replaced yeah so if you so our pvc pipes together are pvc cement glued so just attaching like the cap off um, or, you know, an elbow joint off would prove to be difficult. Um, right. But if you, you know, if you were able to get in there, as we mentioned, it's, since it's very easily assembled um, by a technician to, you know, get in there and unscrew and things, they could, they could replace the motor pretty easily. Okay. So that, that would probably be preferable than replacing mm -hmm. the whole unit. Okay. Yeah, for sure. yeah. yeah, you wouldn't have to replace the pillars if that's what you're asking. Um, because they're axles and ball bearings that connect to the motors, so okay, they could just slide out. Right. Is that is did we answer it, your question? Yeah, yeah, you did. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that, that's most of my questions. So I, I think we're over time, but but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank, okay. thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so let me step in there. We're um, we are over time, but but there's a, a 15 minute break that was built into the schedule, um, so so we're not happily running into the next the next presentation. That one starts uh, at 10:45. But um, given that we have run almost 10 minutes over, it's probably a good time to stop, um, and at least to give everybody a small chance to take a five minute break before the next one. So um, I want to 
thank the um, the group. This is group one. Yeah, I want to thank group one uh, for sharing their design with us uh, and giving us a presentation this morning. Um, I, you guys know I, I love this design. So um, I've said that a bunch of times, but I'm very, very hopeful that this is one that gets picked for, for prototyping. I also really appreciate like, uh, nobody really knows what's going on with the economy. So um, I, I think it was very clever um, to, you know, sort of point out that you're, you're using pre pandemic prices and you've got some evidence that the cost will come down again. Cause a lot of the other groups have sort of commented on the same thing, but haven't really managed to, you know, give a convincing argument <laughs> about, mm -hmm. um, you know, why, why we should consider pre pandemic prices. So, um, and yeah, costs have gone up quite a bit, especially for like petroleum based plastic and stuff products. So anyway, uh, I think that was very clever that, that you guys um, put that in there. So I appreciate that. Um, all right. With that, let's stop recording.